As we get closer to the NFL draft, getting more intel from the folks who know the draft the best, including Mel Kuyper, his latest and final mock draft for 2024 has dropped. What can we learn from there? Surprises, quarterback intel, and making sense of that round one, round two area of the draft. Coming up on today's Peacock and Williamson. NFL analyst Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson bring you expert NFL analysis every day in less than 30 minutes. Get an inside look into the NFL on the field and in the front office. With elite breakdowns, next level analysis, and in-depth information only for the real NFL fans. This is Peacock and Williamson, and it starts now. Welcome to the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Brian Peacock alongside Matt Williamson at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL. Thanks, everybody, for making us your first listen here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We love the everydayers, and we love it, and we appreciate it when you subscribe. Please hit that subscribe button on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Today's episode of Peacock and Williamson is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets, guaranteed. That's 150 bucks. Win or lose, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So we're going Kuiper mock today. We're going to yeah. programming alert. We're going to push the mailbag. I know we talked about it for Wednesday this week. We're going to push it back one day to Thursday because Mel Kuiper's final mock this year is dropped. It's it's here today. And so we're going to talk about that. And he's one of the more plugged in guys and uh, a lot of respect for Mel Kuiper because he's the OG, right? And I know there's other analysts that maybe grind more tape than Kuiper does these days, but he's still plugged in, still knows a lot of GMs. He knows a lot of agents. He knows a lot of folks and is all about the draft and has been my entire life. So uh, props to the OG Mel Kuiper. And I want to give him a little bit of flowers here and talk about some of the intel that he puts in this mock draft that we might be able to learn from in this process. So we'll do the mailbag tomorrow, give you an extra 24 hours to get those mailbag questions in at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL on Twitter, or you can drop it in the YouTube comments. And then on Friday, Matt, I think we're going to do, uh, we're going to d- dig into the beast. Dane Brugler, yeah, right. right. in my opinion, is the current, it used to be the blue book for Mel Kuyper. Yep. Currently, it's Dane Brugler's beast of the athletic. Uh, it's worth the price of admission for the athletic just to get this one document every year, in my opinion. It's the best yeah. draft document all year long. The beast just dropped on this Wednesday and, and it's, it's big. It's called the beast for a reason. So <laughs> it's going to take a couple days to dig into that and, and get the intel from the beast and talk about that a little bit, what we learned on Friday from another plugged in analyst in Dayton Brugler. But today we're focusing on Kuiper's mock draft, man. Yeah. And and honestly, it's two monumental things in the draft cycle is the day the beast comes out, Mel's last mock, you know, because Mel used to do one on the day of the draft. And I was listening to their first draft podcast and he said, I'm done with that. You know, I mean, I'm too busy that day. I, you know, I, I'm putting out one that dropped today that's two rounds with trades. And I don't want to go through every pick, you know, I mean, uh, but I do think it's really interesting to see someone as dialed in and as experienced as Mel, how he thinks the top of this draft is going to go with the quarterbacks and the trades and all those type of things. And if someone trades out, you know, what are they looking for? And then I found it really interesting just, you know, the second day in particular, you know, the end of first into the second, you know, who are the names that he's hearing are going to go in that neighborhood. Like, I don't even necessarily care about the landing spots as much. Right. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not it's not team-specific to player, although mm-hmm. there's some of that. It's more what range are these prospects going to go? Because I think that's yeah. one of the places we get it the most wrong is I think most people know who the top 20 prospects are, and maybe one guy falls out of that, a couple guys fall out, or maybe the order of those guys is, is changed from what we expect to happen in the draft. But it's who's the player that takes a steeper fall than we thought Who's the guy that everyone thought was a third rounder that goes to the end of the first round? Who's the Cole Strange, right? Yeah, and every yeah. draft got those that are like, okay, wow. Uh, I remember the 49ers a couple of years ago drafted Jaquaski Tart in the second round. And people who are casual fans, I know who Tart was, but he was a small school guy, had an interesting name. There were 49ers fans that were like, who is that person? Right. right like, never Tart in the second round? What is that? You know? And so those, those picks are always fun. And uh, we might have a better idea of, of what some of this looks like for a guy who's who's really plugged in in, in Mel Kiper. So let's start at the top quarterback. Yeah. Did you did you take anything away from how the quarterbacks are going in this mock draft? Well, I'll just kind of buzz through just the where the the landing spots are here. I mean, obviously Williams. I think he feels pretty strong about Jaden Daniels going to Washington, sticking there. And I'm starting to get that feeling just from listening to people. 
And then he has May sticking at number three for the Patriots, which May's my second favorite quarterback in this draft, but that would be a tough road for May to land in that spot. But then it gets interesting to me is the Cardinals just hang around, take Harrison, which I've been saying lately, I think is a smarter move for them where I think new England would be a smarter team to trade out. Yeah. And then the, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. There just for a second, because we uh, behind the scenes have been doing uh, a lot of mock draft work. I've done my own mock drafts. You did your own mock draft. We did a dueling mock draft last week. And when you look at what it costs to go to four versus what it might cost to to go to five for the Minnesota Vikings, which is the trade that that Kuiper proposes here is is yeah, going yeah. up to get JJ McCarthy at five and then Malik Neighbors at six. And I think if I had to bet that this is you know before looking at Kuiper's mock, this is kind of the most chalky top six. And I think this is how I would bet it would go because I honestly think it might be an entire first round pick to go from to go to number four instead of number five for the Vikings. At, wow, at that, yeah, That's one spot saying. is a huge jump. Like eleven and twenty three might be enough to go to five. You're gonna have to put in an, an entire first round pick for a team that might draft high in 2025 because you're starting a rookie quarterback for part yeah. or most or all of the year if you're the Vikings and the young rookie quarterback uh, or Sam Darnold. Uh, you, so that that's a big difference to go to four versus five in the cost of that pick. And the question becomes for the Vikings: it, it's a poker match, right? Because do you believe the Broncos or the Raiders are going to give up enough? which would still be three first round picks and to, to go up and get number four ahead of you. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm the Vikings, it's easy for me to say, cause I'm not the team that's looking for a quarterback, but I would say, no, okay, go ahead. If you think you got a better deal, then go ahead. You know, Arizona Cardinals, I'm going to wait for number five. Maybe I'm off base with this, but the, if I was in charge of the Cardinals, I would really have a hard time trading away from one of those top three receivers. So if the Giants want to come from six to four, okay, I'm not going to hold you over the coals for that because I'll get one of my guys. But if it's the Vikes, I'm not going to get one of those receivers. Where if I'm the Chargers, I understand both these teams have tons of needs. Maybe I'm just looking at it differently. But uh, the Chargers, just give me all the first round picks I can get and move back and I'll start to restructure things where the Arizona did that last year. You know? Right. And Arizona's got extra picks. They already got a pick at 27. You know, yeah, and so yeah. you look at what they get at 11 and 23, and they could already get the same prospect at 27, just about that they could get at 23. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and like, so then you start to go down the rabbit hole of, okay, well, if you do move back and you're the Cardinals, well, then you're probably trying to get back up to get one of those receivers. So you're not getting a big difference. And then you're not getting the first choice. You're getting the third choice, right, maybe right. at wide receiver. And then you're giving up draft capital to get back just to do that. And when you add up what 11 and 23 is, and we've done this in mock drafts, you're like, eh, I mean, that's not a great haul. I might as well just have Marvin. I, I'm kind I'm of more Marvin Harrison. one Marvin Harrison than two of um, A.D. Mitchell and uh, Byron Murphy or whatever. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. That's the way I see it for them, where I think the Chargers, who in Mel's mock do move with the Vikings, give me a bunch of stuff. I want to bring in a lot of picks if I'm a new coach. I'm a new organization, basically. And – I think that's the spot, you know, get ahead of the giants, get there at five. And they took McCarthy in this draft. Yes. And and that's, that's the big thing to me though, is pick two. And when we did our dueling mock drafts, we talked about that, how there was some buzz and, you know, it's lying season. So who knows, but Mm -hmm. someone like JJ McCarthy, or to be honest with you, Jaden, if you're doing a mock draft, it's easier to put Jaden Daniels at two. Cause if you don't, then fits start to get really it gets weird. It gets and weird, maybe yeah. the best fit after pick two for Jane Daniels isn't until the giants at six. And that might change what the Patriots are willing to do. Maybe the Patriots mm-hmm. really like Drake may and they only trade out if Drake may gets taken or maybe the opposite. Maybe the, maybe everyone loves Jaden Daniels and isn't so hot on the other guys. So maybe the Vikings are hoping Jaden Daniels gets down and they can trade up for him. So that's the question is which quarterbacks, which teams like, cause I doubt all teams love all four quarterbacks. They can't. I mean, like there's no chance. I mean, if the, no matter who it is, including the Giants, including the Vikings, Denver, the Raiders, I mean, ones that might not end up with one, there's definitely a pecking order, and there's probably a line that they draw after quarterback two or three, and the other one's like, that. Yeah, nope, I'm not I'm not paying this type of price, price for it. So I said it was chalky going to pick six. It's really chalky all the way through 10. And yeah, uh, yeah. you got Alt at seven. You got Dallas Turner, and I keep going back and forth. I had Quinion Mitchell at eight to the Falcons, and mm-hmm. I just keep going back to, gosh, man, the hit rate at cornerback early, uh, and the the potential for what Dallas Turner could be 
and you see what the top edge rushers in the NFL can do for you and what Turner could be. I can just keep going around in circles. I just think the defensive scheme and the fit there could be really nice for Dallas Turner. And so I'm actually back to where Mel is here with Dallas Turner today. But I keep changing with that eighth pick and who the top defensive player might be. I think I do. I would bet right now that it's Dallas Turner just because of upside positional value for that edge rusher and, and what Dallas Turner could be. Because if everyone hits their ceiling, I'd still rather have the stud edge rusher than the stud corner because I don't think that Quinion Mitchell is necessarily in the, the sauce Gardner, Patrick Sertan area of edge rushers. But Dallas Turner could be closer to a Micah Parsons level guy because of how explosive he is. I think he fits the dome. I don't think they've had a good edge rusher or top edge rusher since Jonathan Abr- John Abraham. Maybe. I mean, it's been a long time. They've been searching forever. All that being said, and I don't disagree with anything you just said, I would be so open for business at eight because yes. somebody's going to want a Dunze ahead of the Bears. Well, that's and, the, and, yeah. and that's the Cardinals move or back, backwards. move back up to eight to get Odunze. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Or yeah. some mystery team goes to eight. Yes. And then Odunze nine to the Bears, uh, Bowers 10 to the Jets. Like that's that's the betting favorite top 10. Something's going to blow that up. But right mm-hmm. now that that is sort of the chalkiest. And, and that's what Kuiper's got in the top 10. And I think there's one thing that's not like the other in that top 10 is the defensive player. You know, it's, it's we can fight about who that best defensive player is, where the other nine, I think, are easy top 10 picks. You know what I mean? Not and if it, all, the Chargers, go there, but. if it is the Chargers at 11, J.C. Latham feels like a real nice oh. fit there at right tackle for Jim Harbaugh. Think Harbaugh would like that guy? I mean, Which is why they're on. cool with moving down more so than maybe the Cardinals would be. Right. With this tackle class and the receivers, they need both. I think it works out great for them at 11. They, I bet they adore Latham. And and Fuaga, too. But either way, mm-hmm. you know, big run blocking, beastly, right tackle. Right They've tackle, already got their yeah. left tackle. Easy. Yep. So, that said, that's the top of the draft. Pretty chalky for Mel Kuyper. Let's talk late first round, early second round, and what we make of the day two intel for Mel Kuyper in his final mock draft next. Today's episode of Peacock and Williamson is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And it's playoff time in the NBA and the NHL. Major League Baseball in full swing now in April. And FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. And we're talking to NFL fans here. And there's no games on, but you know what there is? There's the NFL draft. And (laughs) to be honest with you, nothing is more fun all year long at FanDuel to bet on than those draft props. For me, personally. And right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 win or lose at FanDuel. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks to who your team, what position your team will draft in the next NFL draft, who will go number one, who will go number two, who will go number three, all on an app that's safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. What stands out next in Kuiper's mock, Matt? Uh, late first, early second round. This is where, you know, after those clean first round picks are gone, uh, th- there's a really deep day two in this draft. Yeah, I would yeah. say a top 75. And so I think it's been pretty difficult for me to figure out. I, I, I've been able to watch a lot of these guys. Niners are drafting 31. I've done a ton of work on uh, some of these prospects that that I see in mock drafts in the early second, late first round. And I think I have my favorites and I have a good idea of how I like them, but I have no idea how the league is going to look at these guys. So two little notes in the middle of the first round I found were interesting is he is Cooper DeGene going 17 after a really good pro day. Okay. I mean, that that all adds up, but that we can kind of put that to bed now. Oh, side note. I mean, the Georgia guys are working out as we speak, by the way, Bowers and Mims. So that's a little bit interesting too. Yeah. Hopefully get some more times. We're getting some late times on DeGene, Bowers, Mims. We're going to have to cover that probably late in the week or early next week. Uh, Talk a little bit more about the, the Gene Pro Day, what that does. I think Johnny Newton's one of those prospects. The yeah. Yale tackle, Omega G, hasn't done anything. No yeah. no, no workouts, no senior bowl stuff. So workouts are going to be really important for a team to, you know, mm-hmm. just throw a lottery ticket out there and, and draft someone like him on day two, potentially, because it's tough to evaluate just Yale tape and say that you're good drafting a guy as high as people are talking about carrying Omega G. Yeah. yeah. Um, but re- one quick note. Yeah. On this mock draft that stood out to me was that Colts pick at 15, Terry and Arnold corner out of Alabama. If you're going to go corner, uh, I would bet 
just knowing Chris Ballard's history and the athletic profiles he goes for, that he's more Cooper DeJean at 15 than Terry and Arnold, especially if DeJean goes two picks later. Yeah, I 100% agree, especially with their scheme. Um, it's a small note, but I also found it really interesting that Mel had Graham Barton center going way ahead of Jackson Powers Johnson. So, I mean, I, I was just listening to his podcast. He said Barton's gotten a lot of steam. And then I thought it was interesting, too, that he had Worthy going all the way up to 23. And I don't know that I'd take him that high, but I, it only takes one team to be infatuated with what he can do. Uh, so teaser here, another podcast that's on deck for us, Matt, that we've talked about is players that we expect to go higher or lower than where the consensus is. And I'm kind of upset that Mel did this to me because Xavier Worthy was my guy. Screw it all up. Are you kidding me? He ran a 4-2-1. He's going to go way higher than this mid-second round pick yeah. that people are projecting. And so, right. yeah, 23 I, to the Chargers. I like it. I could see the Jags taking Worthy at 17. And we'll all be like, wow. Right. But well, dude, this, that's how the world works. Do you remember John Ross? 4 2 2, right? Right, right, right. Uh, he was projected in the same spot. Late one, early two. Ooh, we like him. Uh, you know, he's a return guy, but man, this speed and you see him dynamic. And uh, granted, John Ross had better production. Like he scored 17 touchdowns or something his last year at, at Washington. Like, yeah, was, he wasn't he, just he was a pretty out. good prospect. Like, he busted hard. And I, I, don't, and I don't know exactly why I, I wasn't paying that close of attention. But he went pick nine, he went way higher than people expected. And people should not be shocked if Xavier Worthy goes not only 23, but top 15. Even. Yeah, it only takes one team to fall in love with a superpower. And I could see him going very high. But yeah. again, he kind of bursts our bubble there with Worthy going 23. That's the highest I've seen him go. In a while. he Right after the yeah. combine, I saw him go higher as kind of consensus wide receiver four. Then he settled back down a little bit. Um, but I wouldn't. you should not be shocked if Worthy goes wide receiver four. But the other problem is there's some other big-time athletes that probably will go wide receiver four if he doesn't do so it's not like you're you're mm -hmm. like okay worthy or a couple of four or five guys no you're talking about guys who also ran four threes that are bigger because he has um, thomas fall all the way to 28 and mitchell all the way to 29 yeah and i would much rather have those two interesting interesting uh your point on graham barton who by the way goes 20 to the steelers mm -hmm. everybody who's plugged in has graham barton going higher and higher and higher and jackson yeah, Howard johnson sliding just a little bit which which i find very interesting and i don't buy it because i think graham barton's an interior player and as much as i like graham barton jackson powers johnson's a better prospect and he's also a guard center too so uh, I, i'm not so sure about that one that's interesting but everyone who's plugged in has that same thing happening and how, how late i don't even see jackson powers johnson on here where is he going i kept scrolling i didn't get all the way to the end yet but I hesitate to say this, but I've said it on other airwaves because trust me, we talk a lot of centers on my Steelers show. Two different people that were unrelated told me there could be concussion stuff with Powers Johnson. I hope that's not true. I don't know it to be true, but as we get closer, he keeps falling and his tape didn't get any worse. I wonder if there's something like that out there. So injury stuff. I hope he's injured at the senior bowl, but he was awesome even while injured at the right. senior bowl and dominated for two days and then stopped, which I love the toughness there. But a medical red flag is the easiest way to fall down a draft board. And I finally found him in Kuiper's mock. He's going mid, kind of early, mid, second round. 47 overall to the Carolina Panthers. I mean, they'd be thrilled unless there's a medical. I mean, of there's course, you know. I mean, right. there's something there. If, if everyone has to, right. I mean, 47 is really low. To have that big of a difference between where Graham Barton is and where Jackson Powers Johnson is, found that uh, really there might be something to some medical red flags for teams. Yep, yep. And there's not a ton of center, center needy teams, but that guy's a first-round prospect on tape. Yes, absolutely. What else to make of the late one, early two guys? Just a couple of the names I, I thought were interesting. Darius Robinson, he goes 27. And I referenced the podcast I just listened to with Mel. And he said like five times, folks, Darius Robinson is going in the first round. It is going to happen. I'm like, I believe it. I mean, that's not the craziest thing I ever heard. And so and, uh, to... Uh, GM and assistant GM of Locked On 49ers, myself and Eric Crocker, we mm -hmm. put on the Darius Robinson tape and we're like, he's not getting past 31 for us. Like, we love the Darius <laughs> Robinson tape. He might lack a little athleticism to chase, like, you know, uh, zone read quarterbacks or something. That might yeah, be an yeah. area of weakness for him. But on third down, maybe he's inside anyway. I think you could bulk him up and play him full time. He's, he's one of those, it's that versatile versus tweener debate. He could play full-time end or full-time tackle. He's not a 
one or the other, or maybe he doesn't quite fit in either. I, I love him setting the edge as a run defender. I love him rushing the passer. He's good rushing the passer from the outside. He's good rushing the passer from the inside. Uh, I love Darius Robinson, and, and teams are going to want a power edge that can control the line of scrimmage, then he's your guy. And so uh, that doesn't shock me if teams love Darius Robinson and he's locked into the first round. He looks like a Baltimore Raven to me. I mean, just yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, have, they, have a, they have a type. And they have already um, some speed guys, so that'd be a really nice fit for them. Defensively. Exactly. I mean, they'll, mm-hmm. they'll fit in somewhere and they'll move them all around, you know. Um, do you want to go to break or do you want to talk about a couple other names that I was shocked where they went? There's one name that, that I don't like at all. Uh, I, that's why I thought there might be a longer conversation. <laughs> Let's wait on <laughs> the one and to work on and uh, trying to figure out the rest of this late one, early day two picture in the NFL draft, courtesy of Mel Kuyper's mock next. Are you tired of watching the shouting matches on your favorite sports TV network? Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN TV all day and you have to turn down the volume from all that shouting and, you know, the fake debates? Well, come on. That's probably why you're already watching or listening to this podcast. So make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news from all the top hosts, the most important stories you'll see Brian Peacock and Matt Williamson all the time on locked on sports today, streaming 24 seven on YouTube subscribe there. And it's also free on Amazon fire TV channels app, part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. So Mel has a third round prospect going to the 49ers at pick 31 here, Matt. And he's a prospect that I've seen in this area and he was billed as poor man's Joe Staley, which is something that's close to my heart. And I was excited. You see an offensive tackle, Roger Rosengarten, at the combine running four nines. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to put the tape on. And I was fully disappointed. And I saw more Ezra Cleveland than I saw Joe Staley. That was my comp, which is a fine prospect, but he's sure. a day guy. And I'd probably be a little disappointed. In fact, I just did a mock draft less than 24 hours ago, a live seven-round mock draft for the 49ers. And I did have the Niners taking um taking roger rosengarten but i have him moving up in the third round to take him uh I, i'm out on him at 31 but i guess you shouldn't be shocked he's an offensive tackle that tested athletically like a an offensive tackle should and we're talking about you know some non-first round grades probably here when you start talking late first round early second round and mel's been doing this a long time and he puts people in the first i think there's a reason he's at 31 not 33 on purpose because i think he wants to be able to say I told you where Rosengarten is going to go in the first round. You know, like somebody's talking to Mel, you know, and I don't blame Mel at all. It's smart, you know, but I, I found that interesting. And I also I found one, one like quick that. note because uh, yeah. we're talking about Mel and how plugged in he is and talking to people. There is an aspect of like you're going to get a lot of good information from a lot of yeah. scouts and a lot of people and a lot of agents, but you're also going to get some misinformation and some bad information. And oh, yeah, yeah. Just as a reminder, people were staring us in the face saying, Mac Jones going number three. Adam Schefter's on TV, looks directly in the camera, says, Mac Jones going number three mm-hmm. to the 49ers. And obviously, we know that didn't happen. Uh, and uh, so there's misdirection. There's things that are wrong. There's things that are right. And that's what fascinates me about this whole prospect. Who's talking to him? Who's not? Uh, how good is the information? But Mel's doing it for a reason. So, yeah, he's, he's saying, th- I, th- I had him in the first round. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think also that's true with Xavier Leggett, you know, the, just get him in right under the cut at 32. Mm-hmm. We've had a lot of buzz about him lately, you know, that he's in a first round guy. And then it kind of gets interesting with two quarterback trades in the second round. Leggett, just, Rosengarten, and Xavier Worthy. Those are the three where you're like, okay, he's he's playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those guys are going early. Yeah. Yep. Good point. So I mentioned the trade. They do the the Will Levis move and the Giants go and move 14 spots to go up to Carolina's pick, and then they take Bo Nix. And then shortly after, the Rams make an L.A. trade with the Chargers and go up to 37 and take Penix. So I could definitely – I think you and I would swallow Nix and Penix a lot different at the top of the second round than 13-14. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's the right spot for him, for sure. That's good. Even if you trade up a couple spots, but yeah, you 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 wait, you take you you take a sleep on Thursday night, Friday morning, and you're like, okay, maybe now we can go get our quarterback if we didn't get him in the first round. Yeah. Uh, So I I like that a lot. So I'm totally into that. That makes perfect sense. Maybe even late first round, but 
You know, and, and to be honest with you, I if you ask me, is Bo Nix going in the first round or the third round? I would say closer to the third round. That, that's just what I think now, and I could be way off on that, but we'll find yeah, out. Yeah, I hear you. TJ Tampa is another name that Mel's been pumping up, and I think one of his mocks, he actually had him in the first. Didn't run tremendous, but I, I think he's near the top of the second here for a reason as well. So the Panthers, after the trade, I kind of like this haul for them. They end up with Lad McConkey at 39, and I Love mentioned that. Jackson Powers Johnson at 47. I mean, you, I would You're... think if both those guys went in the first round and they maneuvered and got a, a couple of good players for them. I mean, that would be a home run draft, I think, for the Panthers. 100%. That's a nice haul for what they need. I mean, maybe the best center, one of the best receivers. I think that's great. Um, another name that popped out at me in the middle, early mid second round is Jerzan Newton, Johnny Newton from Illinois, going all the way at forty two, because his tape to me is a top twenty player. As I, 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 he's a first round guy to me all day, but again, he's been day. injured a little bit. Is there a medical yeah. red flag? He's one of those guys that's still trying to get a pro day in this week before the draft. Yeah, exactly. So it makes me wonder: is there a little more behind the scenes there than we know? Because you just put the tape in; he's the best player in the field every week, right? Um, you mentioned TJ Tampa. I would say Max Melton in the top 40 as well. Mm -hmm. Anders here is another name. It's kind of a late rising cornerback who passes all the physical tests and I think pass the character tests as well and kind of versatile. It's like, what do you want? Do you want the longer corner? There's TJ Tampa. Do you want a guy who can maybe play outside, maybe inside? You got Max Melton. You got Mike Sanders still if you want the pure nickel. Uh, you got Kamari Lasseter in the second round here at 43. Didn't work out well, but teams might not care if they're running certain schemes. They're going to have him play in a certain way. And then you got 44, Ennis Rakestraw. So a lot of corners going right there in the middle of round two. I was thinking, too, there's a lot of corners near the end, too. You know, St. Estro. And like you mentioned, I mean, it's, it's, and it's funny. I just wrote a note this, this morning about how much I liked some of these nickel corners. Drew Phillips is in this second round mix, too. There's some tough little bit undersized that could probably do inside and outside no doubt um yeah andrew phillips is a super athletic corner out of kentucky going 63 kingsley sua Matsuya. i say 64 is an interesting pick the last yeah, one because, so for me i like sua Matsuya more than roger rosengarten so me too. For me, yeah. it's like okay niners if if sua Matsuya is going to be there wait till round two on offense tackle maybe go corner in round one because the corners flying off the board in round two it would amaze me if, if Sumatatia, I kill his name still, it is not a top 50 pick. Well, it's a similar profile to Rosengarten. So for me, it's like, yeah. okay, athletic testing, good work to do on tape. Which profile do you trust? You know, when you when you met the kid is probably the big d factor, right? Is mm -hmm. is and maybe that's what Mel Kuyper's hearing that Roger Rosengarten is just blowing people away in meetings, you know, something like that. So I don't know if there's any truth to this at all, but along those lines, people won't say it in the media. It's kind of like medicals or, you know, off the field stuff. Sometimes they don't think some of these dudes are going to learn quickly. I mean, it, the BYU tackle might be the smartest person on the planet. I have no idea. But if, you know, if it's in Rosengarden might be the dumbest guy on the planet. But if one goes one whole round out in the other, it might just be because teams think one guy can learn quicker than the other you know what i mean or, like yeah or you're trusting the coaches there might be i right remember, who was the who's the big time edge rusher from old miss this is probably going back 10 years and he was a first round athlete all day ended up i think in the second round maybe to the new york giants and turned out to be kind of a bust but when scouts during the fall went to old miss to scout their team the coaches had a, a, a list, a sheet of paper on the outside of the office that said, attention NFL scouts, don't draft these guys because they're not working hard enough. And his name was on it. And his name's on like, it. Like his old coaching staff has a sheet of paper that's telling scouts that are coming through not to draft this guy. And guess what? They were absolutely right because he didn't want to put in the work. And even though he had all the ability in the world, I'm blanking on the player right now. Some listeners wow. probably and let us know who that is but that is huge when you have when especially if you're an area oh, yeah. scout that really trusts the coaching staff and they're like yeah this guy doesn't work man or, or, All the time. or the opposite, where i know this guy doesn't fit everything you're looking for athletically but he is a dog and he's gonna play in the league for 10 years oh yeah, yeah. And you, nothing to worry about with that stuff i'm like okay i mean it's a lot easier for a scout to stand on the table for that guy than Man, I have a good grade on him. His tape is good. I've, you know, all, all the check, all the parameters we have on our scouting forms are pretty strong, but I don't want to go to bat for this guy because my buddy that I trust that 
WVU or whatever told me he's doesn't care. Uh, any last notes from Kuiper's mock before we go, man? Not really. Not really. I think it's pretty solid. I mean, yeah, we could really nitpick it, you know, but uh, I, I think it's a good group of names, and, and I'm sure that he has a good feeling for the neighborhood these guys are going to land in, you know? And my big takeaway here is between pick 64 and pick 27, mm -hmm. there, there might not be any difference in grade. So this could be chaos in that group. Like I yeah. could, you could just completely flip 64 and 23 and do the same mock draft and just have it reversed and be like, oh, that makes sense. I can yeah, see that. Kind of get it. Yeah. Right. And I think day two is really strong. Yeah. It's a, it's a strong area of the draft. Maybe that allows teams more willingness to get out of round one. If someone wants to get up for say Bo Nix or, or Michael Penix or, or their favorite player, maybe uh, some teams have a, a, a big tear drop and, and maybe some teams don't at that point in the late first round, but it, it is a strong, especially strong early day two and even into the top of day three. Right. Or at top the of, bottom right. of the draft is really bad. And people want out six and seventh rounders are worth like nothing this year. Thanks everybody for making this your first listen mailbag tomorrow. Get those questions in on Twitter to Matt or I at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL or drop a question in the YouTube comments back tomorrow right here. Peacock and Williamson.